Okay, so hello everybody, I'm Richard Southwell, and I'd like to talk to you about a project uh, entitled Convergence Dynamics of Resource Homogeneous Congestion Games. So basically, this is a project about game theory, and it's a project about how individuals can organize themselves to share resources. So this is joint work with Zhang Wai Huang, and it was done in the NCEL lab at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So I'm going to start by explaining what a congestion game is. Basically, a congestion game, um, or shall I say the particular kinds of congestion games, which we're going to be considering here, consists of a set of players and a set of resources. And um, each player, P, is associated with a payoff function. And that's some kind of decreasing function. Okay, so um, you could have, for example, F, and might be the function minus X, because that's decreasing with X. Or it could be 1 over X, because that's decreasing with X. Uh, in fact, we're going to see uh, later on that the forms of these kind of payoff functions don't really matter very much for the issues that we want to discuss. So each player is associated with some decreasing payoff function. And the idea is just that um, in the game, each player picks a resource to use and the payoff that they get is given by their payoff function of the total number of users of their resource. OK, so this is the sort of definition of a system that I want to talk about. They're really very simple. The idea is just that um, players don't like congestion. Players don't like using the same resource as many other players. So you can think of lots of different scenarios which have this kind of feature. You think about, for example, cars choosing lanes to drive on. If all the cars drive on the same lane, they're going to be delayed and their, um, their payoff is going to go down as a result. Uh, or you can think about, for example, uh, companies deciding where they're going to place shops. Uh, if two supermarkets, um, supermarket chains decide to put premises next to each other, then those two supermarkets are going to compete with each other and um, damage each other via um, trying to gain the same resources. In that context, the resources would be customers. Uh, and you can think about things like animals as well. Um, Okay, it's not really a conscious decision, but different animals have different eating habits. And um, an animal might be uh, wise to change its eating habits, either via conscious choice or evolutionary pressure, if it happens to be eating the same kind of things as a lot of other animals around the same kind of area. Um, and there's another big motivation behind these systems, which is wireless networks. Uh, so I'm going to discuss more about that a bit later. Um, well, I'll talk about it now, actually. So the thing is, in wireless networks, um, the number of wireless devices is uh, sort of growing. I think it's growing exponentially at the moment. Uh, but each wireless device has to use a piece of spectrum to communicate. And if multiple nearby wireless devices use the same piece of spectrum, they cause congestion to each other. I mean, they call it interference, but basically all it means is that the quality of service that a wireless user uh, enjoys uh, is some decreasing function of the total number of um, users of the same piece of spectrum as they are using. In other words, if we all use the same channel, we get bad quality of service. And so... The problem of how wireless users are going to select which piece of spectrum to use um, is really a kind of congestion game theoretic type of scenario. Um, and particularly with some new wireless technologies, which allow wireless users to sense and switch channels easily, uh, the issue of how, um, how players self-organize in congestion scenarios is becoming increasingly relevant for wireless networks as well. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is some
basically dynamic systems where um, players within congestion games self-organize. So the fundamental idea is this idea of a best a better response switch or a better response update. And what this entails is this entails just one player changing the uh, resource that they are using and benefiting as a result. Uh, so an example would be if you have a load of cars on a busy lane of traffic and then one of the cars switches to a quieter lane, they've changed the resource they're using and have benefited as a result. Okay, And so I really want to talk about what happens and how players in, in these very simple kinds of congestion games can self-organize when they do these sorts of better response switches. And so this is a fundamental theorem behind, um, behind these kind of systems. And it says that a switch from resource I to resource J is a better response if and only if it decreases the congestion level of the player making it. Um, written a bit more symbolically, this would be that xj plus 1 is less than xi, because uh, xj is the total number of um, users of the resource j in the state x, and um, so xj plus 1 will be the total number of users of resource j after uh, this extra guy is switched there. And that has to actually be less than the total number of users of resource I in the current state X in order for the switch from I to J to be beneficial. Um, OK, so basically this is a really nice result because what it says is that the only thing our players want to do in these kind of congestion games is decrease their congestion level. It means that the, um, the payoff functions don't actually matter. As long as they're all decreasing functions, the forms of the payoff functions don't really matter. And the and sort of consequently the identities of the players don't really matter. We can treat our players as homogenous because although they have different payoff functions, that has no effect on their dynamics. To see this in a kind of physical way, I like a sort of physical arguments. And uh, a good physical argument would be, for example, you could have um, you could have a couple of people on roads, and they could have quite different payoff functions. One could be like a casual Sunday driver, and um, you know they're just tootling along, doing a bit of sightseeing. Um, but they still don't like congestion. Okay, so congestion uh, still makes their quality of service function, their payoff function, go down. They still don't like getting stuck behind a slow-moving lorry or something. So they do have some kind of Function, payoff function, which is strictly decreasing with congestion levels, but it's quite an insensitive function that doesn't drop very rapidly with congestion level. On the other hand, we could have another driver who is an ambulance driver who knows that if they don't make it to their destination within a given time, then somebody's going to die or something. And they're obviously in a massive hurry, and so they are extremely aggravated by any kind of congestion, and that would make their payoff function drop rapidly. Well, yes, these two players do have very different um, payoff functions, but in this scenario of trying to pick a lane on a road, they basically have the same kind of motivation, which is just pick the quietest lane. And in a similar way, um, it doesn't really matter what our payoff functions of our players are. They all just want to decrease their congestion levels. Okay, then. So, um, that result gives us a really quite nice, simple way to visualise these systems. I mean, it's almost um, it's almost childish how simple these systems are. Basically, we just have a load of different resources, and we think about how many users there are of the different resources, and all these. So we can think of our players kind of stacked up. So here we've got a scenario where we have five different resources. And, for example, we have four users of the second resource. These users are not very happy because resource four is really quite congested. And these players can see that there are these other resources which are relatively uncongested. And they want to switch to those. And so, under our better response dynamics, 
we just keep allowing these players to update and improve themselves one at a time. So maybe this guy jumps over here, and then perhaps this guy jumps over here, and then perhaps this guy decides to do a better response switch by going to resource one. So uh, now what's happened is that we've reached what's known as a pure Nash equilibrium. This is a state from which no player has an incentive to deviate. That's the definition of a equilibrium. Um, and, you know, basically this is a good scenario. You should notice that the players have now spread themselves as evenly as possible over these different resources. Now, I'd just like to make a kind of footnote about these dynamics, uh, because there seems to be something that people sometimes get confused about when they hear about these systems. The point is that these systems are evolving under better response updates, but we're not restricting how exactly these better response updates are being performed. Um, if you like, these systems are non-deterministic because we're not forcing the system to evolve in an exact way. We're just saying that somehow the system evolves under better response updates. And we want to consider lots of different possible ways that that could happen, you know. Maybe one possibility would be that the first guy updates, then the second guy updates, then the fifth guy updates. Another possibility would be that um, the seventh guy updates, then the fourth guy updates. There's lots of different ways that the system can run, but the only constraint that we're going to make is that exactly one player does a better response update every time step. We're not allowing simultaneous uh, updating between players. Anyway, um, it turns out that if you want to understand the better response dynamics of these kind of systems, quite a good way to do it is to make a kind of picture of the global dynamics of the system. What I mean by that is that you can um, just represent all the different possible states of the system, you know, by just showing how many users there are on the of the first resource and how many players there are using the second resource uh, in all the different possibilities. And then you can just use arrows to represent how um, one state can change into another state because some player does a better response update. And so that that really allows you to see sort of globally all the dynamics of a system. So here's an example of that. We've just got four players and two resources. And for example, because a player moving from resource one to resource two uh, constitutes a better response update, which moves from this state to this state, we draw a red arrow pointing from this state to this state. And this is basically the same thing at the bottom here but we're using numbers rather than these childish smileys to, to know how many users there are of these different resources. Well, okay, so um, maybe you can imagine what these kind of systems look like when you have more players. When you just have two resources, basically, the state space just looks like a great big line, and um, the dynamics just sort of draw the uh, state into somewhere near the middle where the players are as evenly spaced as possible over the resources. But you see some kind of more interesting geometry when you look at cases with three resources. So um, this is a case with three resources here. Um, so notice that we have five players and three resources, and these are all the different states of the system. And just like before, these red arrows here, these represent possible better response updates that can be performed from that state. So, for example, from this state here, there's two fundamentally different kinds of better response updates. And those are that a player could switch from resource one to resource two, and a player could switch from resource two to resource one. And that's why there's two arrows pointing out of this state. Well, I think this is probably, as far as understanding goes, it's probably the most important slide um, in this presentation, because I think that most of the important ideas about these systems can really be gleaned from just looking at this picture. So there's a few things to notice. Firstly, these sync points here are the pure Nash equilibria of a system. 
Uh, these are the places where there's no incentive to deviate from once they've been reached. Uh, secondly, um, paths within this kind of directed network correspond to different ways that the system can run. Um, and so you can see that um, there's actually many different ways for the system to run, and they're not all equivalent. Uh, for example, um, if you start at this date here, which is one of the most congested places to start, where all of the players are using resource number one, well, you can reach a pure Nash equilibrium within three updates, like this, over here, and then up here, and then along here. But you can also take a more kind of convoluted route towards a pure Nash equilibrium, like this, up here, up here, down here, and then along here. And that takes one, two, three, four updates. So that's a kind of more long-winded way to reach a pure Nash equilibrium. Another thing to notice is that in this case, every path that's sufficiently long terminates at a pure Nash equilibrium. What that means is that if you run this system for long enough, the players will eventually self-organize into pure Nash equilibria. And I think you could probably convince yourself of that quite easily. I mean, in a very kind of rough sense, the, um, the players sort of are getting more and more evenly spaced over the resources as they, um, as they do better response updates. If you want something a bit more precise, you can say that the number of pairs of uh, users of the same resource decreases with every better response update. Anyway, this is just one of these systems where we have five players and three resources. If we change uh, the number of players or resources, we get different kinds of pictures of state spaces. And some of them look quite pretty, like this one here, where we have seven players and four resources. Um, the reason this looks so kind of interesting, I think, is because it, it, it really should be drawn in three-dimensional space if you, want to, um, if you want to make a nice picture of this. And this one should be drawn in 4D space if you want to lay it out in a particularly pleasing way. Uh, and you can see one of the striking things about these systems. Um, okay, one of the striking things is that you always get to these Nash equilibria. And um, in particular, if the, um, if the number of players is divisible by the number of resources, you just have one unique point here that corresponds to the Nash equilibrium. And, um, you know, all of these routes, uh, all of these ways that the system can evolve under better response updates end up getting sucked into this Nash equilibrium point here. Um, but I think another thing that's interesting and also kind of important is that you can see that the state spaces really have quite a lot of symmetry. And um, we're actually going to um, talk about that a bit more later. Okay, so there are a few questions one can ask about these kind of systems. Sort of obvious questions. A good one is, what are the Nash equilibria? And then, since we're considering dynamics... Uh, we're going to be interested in what's the fastest way to reach a Nash equilibrium, a pure Nash equilibrium, and also what's the slowest way to reach a pure Nash equilibrium. So we want to sort of quantize exactly how long it takes these players to organize themselves into these kind of um, pure Nash equilibria where they're satisfied with the resource allocation. Okay, so it turns out that the Pure Nash equilibria are actually really quite easy to characterize. Um, they're really characterized by this theorem here. Um, basically, without the algebra, what this result basically says is that a Nash equilibrium in one of these systems is exactly the same thing as a state within which the players are as uh, evenly spaced over the resources as possible. And... Um, I think that's kind of easy to see because these systems are really so simple. I mean, um, if there was more, if there was a difference of two between the numbers, between the um, number of users of a pair of resources, then some player could benefit by jumping from the most congested resource into the one 
which was slightly less congested. So the only possible equilibria are where there's only a um, difference of at most one between the congestion levels of the different resources. And such a state is effectively where the players are as evenly spaced over the resources as possible. So the Nash equilibria are pretty easy to characterize. Uh, what about the fastest convergence time? Well, that's a little bit more complicated. Um, and so in this picture here, I've shown a stake space. This is for where we have six players and three resources. And I've used these purple hexagons here to illustrate these kind of shells of states which have different um, values of this Bx here. So what's Bx? That's the fastest possible convergence time from state X. So um, the states in this first hexagonal shell here, it takes one update to get to the pure Nash equilibrium from those. Uh, in this second shell out here, it takes two um, better response updates to get to the pure Nash equilibrium from those states. So these are the, Bx is essentially the best possible, the fastest possible runtime of the system when initiated from state X. And you can see from this picture that there's some definite kind of geometry behind uh, this kind of definition of Bx. Well, in fact, um, we can get an exact, an exact um, formula for Bx. So this is an exact formula for the case where we have n players and our resources. And um, this just gives the, um, the minimum number of better response updates you need to convert state x into a pure Nash equilibrium. Um, I'm not going to um, go into the formula too heavily, but I'll try and give you some intuition behind it. Basically, what is bx? Basically, Bx is the minimum number of switches of any kind that are required to convert X into a pure Nash equilibrium, okay? So if we just define a switch as where some player changes the resource that they're using, not necessarily in a way that benefits them, just in any way at all, then it turns out that Bx is just equal to the minimum number of switches we need to convert X into a pure Nash equilibrium. In other words, um, under our better response updates, our system can be converted into a pure Nash equilibrium um, with as little change in the strategies of the players as is possible. Um, so in a sense, it's possible for our systems to self-organize into pure Nash equilibrium with the minimum possible amount of effort, uh, even regarding sort of centralized mechanisms and such. So what's this formula? Basically this formula is just the number of switches, the number of units you need to shift around to convert X into a Nash equilibrium. And more precisely, it's equal to half of the Manhattan distance between uh, from X to some uh, to some pure Nash equilibrium. So uh, you look at all the set of pure Nash equilibria, you pick the one that's closest to you with respect to Manhattan distance, and then Bx is equal to half of that Manhattan distance. So there's a nice simple formula for the fastest runtime of these systems. And then now you know the formula, a good question is, how can you actually reach a pure Nash equilibrium within the fastest possible amount of time? And it turns out that that's actually really easy to do. To make the system converge in the fastest possible time, uh, there's a real simple procedure, and that is just keep uh, having the, a player on the most congested resource switch to the least congested resource. So uh, that's kind of what you would guess, I suppose. That turns out to be a very efficient way of updating the system, and it pushes the thing into a pure Nash equilibrium really fast, as fast as possible. Okay then, so that's a little bit about the fastest possible convergence time of these systems. Another good question to ask, and actually 
a more challenging question is what about the slowest possible convergence time of these systems? Uh, so let's denote that by WR of N. Well, we can give a nice sort of spatial interpretation to this quantity because basically WRN is just equal to the length of the longest path in the state space here, you know, in this directed network which shows the better response dynamics. So in this case here then, where we have three resources and five players, the longest possible convergence time is equal to four because the largest number of updates which uh, you can do to make a system run for a long time uh, are like this. If you, The worst case scenario would be to start from uh, this state here uh, or something equivalent where all the players are using one resource and then to do the better response updates in a rather inefficient way. And then you can uh, draw out the system for quite a long time and make it make it last for four updates until it reaches a pure Nash equilibrium. Well, it's important to characterize um, the longest runtime because then you have a kind of bound and you know uh, you can give a kind of guarantee that the systems are always going to converge in you know this amount of time or less. So how do we characterize the longest runtime? of one of these systems. Oh, you might just want to note, this is defined globally, okay? So before the shortest runtime, I was defining it with respect to a particular state, but now I'm just defining this with respect to a particular number of resources and players, uh, because it's actually just a harder thing to calculate. So I just went for a, a global evaluation because that's simpler. Okay, so these are formulas about WRN. These are all the results I've got about it, basically. Um, and I don't really want to go into all the details of the proofs of these things. Um, but, okay, basically, um, basically, there's there's something called the partition lattice. And it it turns out that WRN is, is uh, quite well related to that. I shall just say a couple of things about that in a minute. But basically, these are all the formulas which I've derived for WRN. So remember, WRN is the slowest convergence time when we have uh, R resources and N players. And the important result here is this one in the red box, because there is an upper bound and a lower bound to WRN here. And the really important thing is that you should be able to see that as the number of players becomes very large... Um, these upper bound and lower bound actually converge to each other. And so this gives us an asymptotic form for WRN. Uh, we have that it's equal to this uh, when N is large. And so this is a really nice result. In fact, we've really shown here that WRN only grows linearly in both the number of resources and the number of players. And so what that's telling us is that these very simple kinds of congestion games can really and always really self-organize into pure Nash equilibria very fast. And we can also get various different exact expressions for the shortest runtime in special cases. And um, to get a sort of general formula for this, um, this quantity is something which I haven't been able to do yet. I think it's possible, but um, things get very, very complicated and kind of interesting when you get into the um, into this kind of uh, problem. So just to give you a rough idea how, how I got those results, one thing to notice about these state spaces is that they have a lot of symmetry. And uh, it turns out that a lot of that symmetry is basically redundant. And you can kind of just consider, just sort of fold up the state space and just consider one piece of it. More precisely, if you restrict your attention to the states which have their entries in descending order, then um, you just get a little chunk of the state space and, you know, all the convergence properties, you know, like what's the shortest path length, what's the longest path length, etc. They're all pretty much the same as if you'd asked a question on the, 
on the larger network. So one of the stages in this is to um, is to change the is to turn your attention to this kind of uh, reduced state space here, where we only have states who have their congestion levels in descending order. And then you can see that this kind of state space is actually equivalent to something called the partition lattice. And using various results from that and making some new ones allows one to derive bounds on this longest convergence time. For example, here, when we have four resources uh, and seven players, you can show that the longest convergence time is equal to eight. OK, then. So that's a little bit about these general congestion games. Now, when we actually did this work, we're really interested in what the applications are for wireless networks. And so, in particular, we're interested in cognitive radio. So let me just give a, a rough kind of introduction to cognitive radio. OK, so basically the idea is that, as I've already said, the, um, the number of wireless devices is increasing. And that's basically leading to something that's, that people call spectrum drought. Basically, that means there isn't enough wireless spectrum, spectrum to go around. Um, and so um, people have invented something called... Uh, but there's another, there's another effect going on, and that is that, well, the vast majority of wireless users are just using a few of the different channels because there aren't that many channels available to them. There are some other channels ones which most of the users aren't allowed to use. Uh, there are these things called licensed channels. So different uh, organizations own the exclusive rights to transmit on particular channels. And the thing is that they're not making full use of those things. Um, they're not making full use of those licensed channels, but the unlicensed channels are heavily congested. And so uh, a new technology um, called cognitive radio has been developed, which allows um, users to sense congestion levels, to sense whether the holders of the whether the users of these licensed channels are online or not, and to switch channels rapidly. And the idea is that when the license holders are offline, the unlicensed users can opportunistically access these licensed channels. And so, effectively then, from the unlicensed user's point of view, what we've really got going on is a kind of congestion game within which the set of resources that are available is changing dynamically. And that's what I've tried to illustrate with this system. I mean, um, if you want to think of a simpler system, although somewhat contrived, um, largely, we can go back to our old analogy of the road network again. Uh, think about cars driving along roads, and then, you know, after a few miles, there's some roadworks, so one of the lanes gets blocked off, and so suddenly one of the resources essentially disappears, and all the drivers have to self-organise across the remaining lanes. And then, you know, sometime in the future, roadworks end, the, uh, the lanes become available again, and then perhaps you enter onto a dual carriageway and there are more lanes available. So during a journey in a car, again, we have a similar kind of effect that the number of resources available changes dynamically. Anyway, um, in the cognitive radio context, since there's so much money in that, it's very important to understand how these cognitive radio users can adapt themselves to these changing um, available spec, changing spectrum availabilities, um, and so essentially, as the set of available resources changes, the pure Nash equilibria of the system move, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate with this picture here. So the x-axis is time, and the y-axis, um, somewhat erroneously, represents state. Okay, so really. The state of one of these systems is a point in 
high dimensional space. But for the sake of uh, illustration, I just represent it as a point along a line, okay? So basically all this diagram is saying is that the Nash equilibria are gonna move around in time because um, the set of available resources changes. And then it's the job of the users to try and keep up with these moving Nash equilibria. Are they going to be able to adapt fast enough to keep up? Or maybe they're not. Maybe they're uh, updating quite slowly. And in that case, it's kind of bad news because if the players can't self-organize quick enough to adjust to the changes in the available resource set, then they're always going to be lagging behind and they're going to be wasting a lot of energy essentially chasing after something which is moving too fast for them to keep up with. Well, I had a study of this phenomenon and I made a very basic model of it uh, that if we suppose in the cognitive radio sense that new channels come on with a probability P1 and old channels come up, uh, go off with probability P0, then um, I use the um, results um, about convergence dynamics to calculate uh, how fast the users need to be able to switch to keep up with these changing uh, with these changing uh, channel sets, and you know if they can if they can update at least this quickly, then um, they'll be able to keep up. Okay, so if you're interested in modeling wireless networks, and we are, um, then there's an important effect missing from these models, and that is space. You see, it's simply not true that every individual in a wireless network on the same channel causes congestion to one another. Um, you know, if that was true, it would be a very odd world because there would be people in Australia who were using, you know, if you're in England, there'd be somebody in Australia who's using the same channel as you and causing you um, congestion. That's, um, that's a bit silly. Uh, the truth of the matter is that only very nearby users cause each other, say, significant congestion when they're using the same channel. And so, in fact, the spectrum sharing uh, thing has a distinct spatial aspect to it. And rather than supposing it's a game where everybody interacts with everybody, it's a lot more sensible to think of a system as a game on a graph. And uh, in this paper here, uh, that's exactly what we consider the system to be. Anyway, uh, I, I sort of elaborated on some of these results, so I want to talk about it a little bit. So basically, we're now considering congestion games which are played on graphs. A graph is basically where you have a load of dots called vertices, which are connected by some lines, which we call edges. And the idea is that um, we can represent the different resources that these different players are using by colors. And the idea is that rather than everybody uh, potentially causing congestion to everybody else, we suppose that now the congestion level of a player is just equal to the number of users of their resource, which are linked to them, okay? So basically, players only get congestion from their neighbors on the network structure. So for example, this guy here, has, he's using red, and he has two neighbors who are also using red. So he's gonna to turn to use a different resource uh, and decrease the congestion level. And so we turn green. So we can think of this system as defined exactly as before, except that now the players are only causing congestion to each other when they're linked on the network. And that would, so that would be another better response update. And um, when we define the system in that way, we get a similar property to before that essentially all the players want to do is decrease their congestion levels. So we get a nice kind of, um, a nice easy to interpret um, way of looking at the better response dynamics. Um, essentially a better response update is just where a player 
changes the resource they're using and decreases their congestion level as a result, decreases the number of players they have who are using the same resource as them. Um, and we also get some other results. These sort of graphical generalizations, they also have this property that they can self-organize to pure Nash equilibria and they can do it quite quickly. Uh, in particular, it turns out that the total number of edges linking users of the same resource decreases with every better response update. Um, and that has a pretty powerful uh, implication because it implies that if our players do better response updates, then they've got to reach a pure Nash equilibria within at most this amount of time, which is equal to the maximum number of edges in the system. Because the number of edges with both of their terminals of the same color, or using the same resource, if you like, has to decrease by integer steps. So the thing can't run for more than this amount of time. And one can also get another result, which bounds the amount of congestion that any player gets, any player incurs at a pure Nash equilibrium. And um, this is quite a nice result because it says, for example, that if we have more resources available than the maximum number of connections a player has, then every player is going to be totally happy at every pure Nash equilibrium of the system in the sense that they're not going to be suffering any congestion at all. Um, OK, so that's pretty much the end of everything I want to say about these systems. I guess I can summarise quite a few of the results uh, with this plot here, which just shows um, the convergence time for the case where we've got four resources and different numbers of players. Um, and so this kind of gold curve at the bottom here, this shows the very best convergence time possible. Um, and this purple curve here at the top, this shows the very worst case um, congestion curve possible. So these are exact tight lower and upper bounds for the convergence time of our of our um, systems running you know the first systems I talked about not the graphical ones okay and then this blue curve here this shows the the convergence time when we do random better response updates I haven't uh, derived a formula for this this is generated by using a computer but you can see that uh, when we just do random better response updates, the thing, the convergence time is a lot closer to the best possible time than it is to the worst possible time. Uh, okay, so thanks for your attention. I'm Richard Southwell. Um, I hope you have a nice day.